The Mount Sinai Otolaryngology Surgical Video Series presents Total Thyroidectomy. This procedure is performed by our department head and neck surgeons as well as select general otolaryngologists for thyroid cancer, Graves' disease, and multinodular goiter causing airway compression. This video is edited by Zachary Schwamm. Here we have a patient undergoing total thyroidectomy for benign disease. The incision line as well as suprasternal notch are marked. A 15 blade is used to incise the skin and a bovie is used to get down to the platysma muscle which is labeled. A bovie is used to incise the platysma. We eventually get to the plane just above the anterior jugular veins. We then raise the subplatysmal flap superiorly. A mosquito is used to provide counter traction. We then change our view such that we are looking from the right side. An inferior subplatysmal flap is raised. Changing perspective again, we now look from superior. To raise an inferior subplatysmal flap, a mosquito is used to make vertical tunnels that are then connected. The right anterior jugular vein is clipped and ligated. Soon we come upon the midline refae. The straps tend to diverge from each other inferiorly. The white of the trachea can be seen. The straps on either side are picked up and the midline is split. Now looking from inferior, one can see the midline refae with the strap muscles on either side. The soft tissue of the neck is split in the midline. The midline soft tissue is further dissected with a mosquito. Once down to the level of the thyroid, remnant strap muscle must be removed from the superior pole. A bipolar and kidney are used to burn and sweep the straps off the gland. This is done until we reach the depth of the common carotid artery and internal jugular vein, which are labeled here. The thyroid gland is pulled inferomedially to get counter tension to remove the straps. A clamp is then used to isolate and ligate the superior pole vasculature. More muscle is removed from the surrounding gland. The rest of the superior pole vessels are dissected and ligated. The midline superior aspect of the gland is bipolared off the trachea. We then partially deliver the thyroid from the neck. Pulling it up and away gives one the necessary counter traction to dissect the lateral fascia that encases the nerve. The borders of the thyroid, carotid, and a potential parathyroid are shown. Some of the fascia is brushed laterally to better define the common carotid artery which is shown here. While we initially thought that this yellowish protrusion from the thyroid might be a parathyroid gland, we discover it has no independent blood supply and is in fact part of the thyroid. The gland is again distracted to the contralateral side and a kittner sponge is used to brush the fascia off the gland and trachea. A small vein is ligated. With the gland partially delivered, we can now see the thyroid gland, a parathyroid, and the white of the trachea. 
We will start by dissecting the parathyroid off the thyroid gland to preserve its blood supply and ability to regulate calcium homeostasis. After the parathyroid is partially dissected off, we can see the cleavage plane. We anticipate the recurrent laryngeal nerve to be between the superior para and the thyroid gland with a somewhat more lateral course on the right. Once a bit of fascia is swept off the gland, the recurrent laryngeal nerve can be seen. The nerve is then traced out. It is important to stay right on the nerve and to be cognizant of early branching. The overlying tissue is bipolar. Coming from superiorly and right on the airway, the overlying tissue is released. We then bipolar the gland off the airway. The anterior trachea is a safe plane of dissection. The thyroid must then be released from the nerve in order to remove the gland. We dissect right on top of the nerve, sequentially releasing the superficial tissue. We continue the same process, highlighting the nerve and direction of dissection. Then with the Kittner sponge protecting the nerve at the cricothyroid joint, a bipolar is used to release the last of the thyroid from the airway. A tiny remnant is left to protect the nerve as this is benign disease. The rest of the right side of the gland is removed from the trachea and is delivered. We can now see the right half of the resection cavity with the skeletonized trachea, right cricothyroid muscle, common carotid artery, and recurrent laryngeal nerve. We now turn our attention to the left side. Retractors are placed under the left strap muscles and kittners are used to brush the muscle off the gland until the carotid can be seen in the depth. The left thyroid is clamped and retracted inferomedially, exposing wispy fascia that is bluntly dissected. Pulling the gland infralaterally exposes the cricothyroid and the superior pole vessels. To effectively ligate the superior pole, dissection occurs in the cricothyroid, aka Joel space, an avascular plane between the superior pole and cricothyroid muscles. While not present in this case, one must be careful to avoid damaging the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve, which may run in the superior pole vasculature a significant percentage of the time. The superior pole is dissected out and ligated, making use of the avascular plane that is Joel's space. Next, the inferior pole vessels are dissected out and ligated. With the gland rolled out to the right, the plane of tissue to release is shown. A stimulating dissector is used to ensure the recurrent laryngeal nerve is not within the dissected tissue. Fascia and vessels are sequentially dissected out and ligated.
The shadow of the left recurrent laryngeal nerve is shown, and the nerve is dissected out and subsequently stimulated with the clamp to confirm it's indeed the RLN. Next, the thyroid must be removed while releasing or dropping the parathyroid and RLN. We will dissect along the black dashed line to preserve the para's blood supply as well as the nerve. Lastly, the inferior pole vessels are sequentially clipped and coagulated. The last attachment is bipolared off. Next, the fascia over the straps is closed, leaving a space inferiorly for blood to collect in case of hematoma.